I'm recording this talking back video about ancestors during the spooky season or the season of the witch, i.e. October. <laughs> but for a great many of us, we recognize that ancestors are close every day of the year. The veil is thinnest at Samhain and Beltane, so everyone can feel it. For many witches, this right here is the most wonderful time of the year. This video is going to take a deeper look at ancestor work by answering the questions that you have sent to me <laughs> over the last couple of years. Hi, I'm Lorelai Black, and this is Blade and Broom. Let's jump right into that sweet witchcraft. As in my other talking back videos, I won't be addressing any troll type comments because I delete those. None of us have the spoons for that. I've grouped today's questions into categories because I've noticed some strong trends in the kinds of questions that I get asked about ancestor work. So category number one, the recently deceased. But I was wondering how soon after a family member passes can you worship slash venerate slash work with them and communicate? Like, is there a time frame after death that you have to give the space to cross over? Or and something? I just want to try to draw his spirit in and tell him he had so many who loved him and I loved him so much. Can I do a similar ritual perhaps to try to contact him? I know he's around because sometimes I do feel him and I've been having dreams of him. But in the dreams, I can't seem to get his attention. He's always turned away and chatting with someone, and I scream out to him, and I wake up. Not sure if he's blocking me or trying to get through. Some cultural traditions are going to have a set time period for that space and time when a soul is crossing to the other side of the veil, crossing over or passing over the ninth wave, or just generally, like, stepping into and settling into what comes next. I call this orientation. <laughs> and in my experience and practice and observation, I've noticed that it takes a different amount of time. It's very individualized for each soul. Some are ready to work days or weeks after they pass. Others, it might take months or years. Sometimes dead folks show up in dreams shortly after they passed, but this is also pretty spotty. Sometimes they need the support of the living and sometimes specific living people in order to make that transition. And sometimes they feel really strongly about saying farewell, giving the last piece of advice, having one last very clear interaction before moving on into whatever comes next, before they get settled into orientation. The really important thing here is not to feel insulted or slighted or left out if you're not the person that they showed up for. Um, it might have a lot more to do with them and what they need in that moment or about how well they feel like you're dealing with things or on some level about their own ability to cross that bridge. Sometimes certain connections are easier to sort of travel along the lines, the links that are still existent. You can still give them love and support and offerings immediately after they've passed, like before the funeral, even immediately after they've passed, if you're so inclined adopted and unknown ancestors. I'm adopted and I don't know my family history, nor can I buy a DNA kit. My adopted mom refuses to talk to me about her family. What do I do? I want to start ancestor work. This one hits close to home for me too. My father was adopted, which means that there are some mysteries in my family tree. Whether your family's been shaped by adoption or not, I would say there's always some level of unknown in the family tree and in your genealogy. The records always stop somewhere in every part of our lines, in every branch. 
I did a whole video about addressing this. The links are in the cards and down in the description box. The super short Cliff Notes version of my advice is to make space on your ancestor altar for the unknown ones and to make space in your practice for them to make themselves known to you. Number three, personalities, preferences, and prejudices. Me is my recent ancestors, such as my great grandmother is very Catholic. And while I know she's loved me and cared about me, no matter what, she won't support that I practice witchcraft. So I don't know if it's a good idea to have an altar for her. Kind of confused how racism can still be a thing on the other side. Do they still have their skin color? So one basic like condensed version of a question that I get a lot is to what extent do dead folks still exhibit the personalities, preferences, and prejudices that they exhibited when they were living folks. I understand the soul as a tripartite soul or a soul in three parts or three souls that are linked in one living person, if that way of framing it makes more sense. My tradition references them as the black soul, the white soul, and the red soul. When we die, the black soul, which carries the ego, the sense of identity, the sense of self, unlinks from the ancestral red soul and the divine white soul. My understanding is that the red and white souls stick together and go on to do what they do next, but the black soul is doing its own thing. When we communicate with the dead, we are often communicating with their black soul, that soul part that retains the ego and the identity. And therefore, also, the memory, the prejudices, the preferences. I think that it's possible for the black soul to continue its growth and its journey even after death. I do not think we stop growing when we die which can translate then into a stridently religious person learning to be more accepting of things like differences in orientation or religious choices that they would not have been ready to accept when they were alive. It can also translate to a racist person moving along the spectrum and along the continuum toward inclusivity and, and an equitable worldview. But also, those black souls can stay stuck where they are because they do still retain the personality and the ability to make choices that they had when they were alive. If a black soul is determined to cling to the ideals and values and decisions that they had, that they made when they were alive, we can see them perhaps not moving and not growing. Some of the work of ancestral healing is to help those souls along their journey toward that growth. And some of the work, probably the bigger portion of the work, is to heal those wounds in ourselves so that we don't carry that pain, that trauma forward into the world. Number four, selective ancestor work. There are some I don't want to connect with and only like two I do. My most recently deceased ancestor is a terrible person. Like live flowers on her grave die and fake ones melt, terrible. How do I avoid her? I'm looking forward to building a relationship with my ancestors, particularly the female bloodline. Would this be disrespectful toward the male bloodline? Is it okay to pick and choose which ancestors you honor? You know, that's a judgment call that only you can make for yourself. It's certainly allowable. I mean, who's going to stop you? Who's even going to know <laughs> unless you tell them? But whether or not it sits right with you to exclude some ancestors and include others based on 
gender, side of the family, background, whatever reasons that you might have, can't answer that for you. For myself, I give honor, love, and offerings to all of my ancestors. I wouldn't be here right now as the glorious incarnated me if it weren't for all of them and their faults and their flaws, as well as their virtues. But I also engage in the hard work of ancestral healing. Part of that for me is embracing the law of paradox or the law of true falsehoods which says that two opposing things can be true at the same time. For example, a great many of my ancestors were pioneers who risked life and destitution in order to make a better way of living for their progeny. And also, my ancestors were colonizers who took life, land, liberty, and livelihood from indigenous and enslaved peoples. I can accept both of those things as true and as the same acts at an essential level. The pioneering and the colonizing are the same thing. The building a new and better life for them and for me was the same act as making it terrible for somebody else, taking what did not belong to them. And by accepting both of those things is true, it allows me to honor them and the good parts about what they did, the good aspects of their lives, while at the same time authentically engaging deeply in the ancestral healing that I need, that they need, and that my own progeny needs in order to do better. Now, as for the part about working only with the female line, again, you can. And I was initially taught within the witchcraft tradition that I was raised up in, that as a woman, someone who is assigned female at birth and is also a cisgender female person, that accessing my family line would be easiest through my mother's, 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 or the matrilineal ancestral line. My mother's, mother's, mother's as far back as I can go. The thing is that suggestion wasn't meant to exclude the men of my line, the husbands, sons, and fathers of those same women that I was tapping into the line that connects us. It was meant as a suggestion to allow me to sink deeply into my blood and that red thread that connects me to all of my biological ancestors. More than that though, what I understand as a person who is deeply involved in genealogical research as a way to connect with my ancestors is that we all have more than two lines of ancestry. It isn't just my mother's 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 and my father's father's father's. There are people of every gender in the mix all the way back to the beginning of time, right? Yes, we all have two biological parents, but they did too. They had, they each had two biological parents and they had two biological parents all the way back. This graphic is a good visual representation of how many individuals that is for just 10 generations. And this one breaks it down nicely by generation so that you can see what those numbers actually are. To focus only on my mother line would mean that I only honor and give myself access to nine of these individuals beyond myself out of 2046. And that again is just for 10 generations. 10 generations ago was only a couple of hundred years. And if it's learning from and honoring the women specifically, 
in my ancestral heritage, then I've left out 1,014 of them by only focusing on my mother line. As is my nature and my philosophy, I am not saying that you can't do that. I'm just suggesting that you look closely at whether or not you want to and why you want to, what you think you'll gain and also what you might lose as a result. Number five, abusive ancestors. Any advice on how to reconcile loving your memories of an ancestor while being aware that they had a direct hand in causing your childhood trauma? I feel like my inner child work and ancestor work are at odds. How do we work with and honor ancestors who had a direct hand in our abuse and trauma? Or whose indirect hand is nonetheless palpable and present. First and foremost, my advice is that we do our best and that we focus on the work of healing ourselves first. I am not a family trauma survivor, so the best that I can actually offer here is speculation and sympathy. I would be very appreciative and grateful to anybody who wanted to share their experience of engaging in ancestor work who does have a lived experience of family trauma to share their suggestions and advice in the comments below. My suggestion is to start again with the law of true falsehoods and to consider those things that you know to be true about those ancestors, but which might also be or seem conflicting. You would know better than me what those things are. You would know better than me what those things are in your personal experience. Maybe it was that they loved you and they hurt you. Maybe it was that they were a victim of abuse as well as being an abuser. Maybe it was that they tried their best and they failed spectacularly. Only you and they can say what those paradoxes are. And I am not here telling you that you need to give abusive ancestors the space and time to be able to share that information with you from their perspective or that this is work that you have to dive into. Focus on healing yourself first. And then if you are drawn to it and you feel inclined, circle back to working with those ancestors. If you choose. Number six, prerequisites to ancestor work. If I'm a beginning practitioner, do I have to know some subjects before going into ancestor practice? like protection, circle casting, etc. In my practice and experience, there is nothing that you need to know, do, or have from a magical perspective before you get into ancestor work. Wherever you are in your witchy practice is fine. Not a witch, not a problem. Don't have space for an ancestor altar. Don't give that anxiety about its space in your brain. Ancestor work can be as simple as opening up to a simple conversation between you and them. Could your practice be enhanced by knowing some magical basics? Heck yeah, most things could. But don't let being a noob stop you, not in this case. Do you have to be a certain religion or be working witchcraft as a religion in order to engage in ancestor work? No, I don't think so. Now, there are certain religions and spiritual systems that have ancestor veneration like built in, baked into the practice. But if that's not where you're coming from, that's not where you have to start. <laughs> Come from where you are. Start in the place where you exist now. We all have ancestors, after all. 
So this is, this is work. This is a practice that we can all do. Number seven, giftedness or specialness. Do you think ancestors call more strongly to certain people? And do you have any insight into why that might be? The possibility that we are gifted or special is a very appealing proposition to the human ego. As is, I think, the proposition that the idea that it is this giftedness that gives us special access to uh, spiritual techniques or mystic ideals is also very appealing. But I don't think it's entirely true. The piece of it that is true is that some people have natural talent. And this can manifest in lots of ways. So some people naturally have great hand-eye coordination and it makes them excel at playing sports or video games. Video gaming. One can have a natural talent as well with the unseen. Similarly, some folks have natural challenges that can make actions or activities a little bit harder or even a lot harder. The part that is not true is the idea that it is what it is and you're just stuck with whatever level of talent or challenge that you were born with. A natural talent can get dull and rusty or even just like stay really basic without practice and development. And a natural challenge can be improved with interest, practice and accommodations or workarounds. Our greatness at something is, I think, a reflection of our commitment to it. Where I personally think that witches and psychics of all types differ from other people is not in our inherent ability that we were born with, but rather in our choosing to engage with the spirit realms. <laughs> Um, and in choosing to live and work within this paradigm. Number eight, teen or broom closet issues. I can't put out food because I'm in the closet and my parents will get mad at me for having food in my room. Will my ancestors be mad at me because I can't do that? And what else can I do? Can I use instead of food? I actually plan on doing a whole video soon-ish about um, special considerations for teens in witchcraft. And I've already done a couple of videos, which are going to be in the cards and in the links below about being in the broom closet or about coming out of the broom closet and also about practicing stealthy witchcraft. So the advice that I'm going to give here and now is the same for young people who are having to live within the rules of the house, um, wherever it is that you're living. Same, same advice for young people as it is for anybody who's needing to keep their practice on the down low. When it comes to ancestor work, I personally think that our ancestors are a lot more disappointed in us choosing to ignore them or choosing not to engage with them than they ever would be in us not being able to engage with them in the way that we see somebody else doing it or the way that other people are saying we must do it. They'd rather that we did something and connect with them than to do nothing. Can't leave out food for the ancestors as an offering. I've got lots of workarounds. Maybe you could leave out fresh flowers and a glass of clear water. Or you could portion off a piece of your meal that you just don't eat and you silently offer to that to them. Or you could take a few bites of the food with a silent offering to the ancestors and asking them to consume it through you, 
who is their flesh and blood after all? How about making offerings of food and drink when you're outside and on your own, if such times ever exist in your life? And I'm sure that you have some time when you're outside by yourself and nobody's watching or wouldn't know that the food that you're leaving is intended for ancestors and not necessarily for squirrels. There's almost always a workaround to external rules, to somebody else's rules, as long as you're willing to be creative and maybe a little bit subversive. You know, a witch. And that's all I have to say about that for today, folks. If you've got more questions about ancestor work, leave them in the comments below. They may develop into a whole video topic, or we may hit them again on another Talking Back later. Or if you've got advice for other folks in our community about how to handle some of the questions that have come up in today's video, feel free to drop that advice in the comments as well. I would love for this to be a whole group conversation. If you found today's chat useful, encouraging, or thought-provoking, please bless me with the magic of the like button and tell your witchy friends that good stuff is happening here at Blade and Broom. Can't wait for another new video to drop next week. Why don't you check out this one? I'll see you soon. Bye, friends. Here come I too.